so what is social data? So it's what we tweet about, it, what we put on Facebook, but at its core, um, it's what we've been doing for a long time, it's just another medium, it's what we're exchanging with family, friends, and acquaintances about ourselves, about what we care about, um, and sharing information and passing it along, right? It's a word of mouth. So the important part about this that's not ever been available before from a scalable format is understanding where people are right now. What is their passion today? Like six years ago, I didn't really care much about kids' education, but now my twins are almost six, right? It's a big part of my life. So if you're going to connect with me, you got to be there with me. And so this is, is an opportunity to be with your donors at every step of the way, wherever they sort of continue to evolve in life. Okay? One of the really interesting things, as well, is there's so much information that doesn't fit in a structured system, a CRM system. 90% of what we can know about people just doesn't exist and can't fit there. So just think about how we can improve that, how we can get that into a way to understand. So part of the excitement um, of what uh, is going on is taking all this unstructured information and building it into ways to, to better the advocacy, the relationships, and the cultivation. So what they'll talk about today as well is how does all this information and learning get into what the programs they're implementing at the organization. So I'll skip this story for, for the moment, get to it later if we have time. Um, why is it important? So it was really interesting to talk to uh, people at St. Jude. came from um, Susan Ray when I visited with them. The important part here is just that the data constantly changes. That's one different thing as well. The amount of information that changes on a daily, weekly, monthly basis about the donors is such at a high volume that it needs, it's not a single data append. It's not something that just happens at a single time, but it's an evolving understanding of the donors and how they change, how they behave, and what they are looking for. Um, so it's a really interesting part, but the big idea here is that it's not necessarily just about doing social better. There's a part of that, but the bigger implications are how does this affect the rest of the organization, the advertising campaign, sustainer drives, all of those parts of the business that don't have a social sort of presence but they can learn so much to sort of better their performance. That's really sort of what the sort of big lift is and why it's so critical um, at this time, okay? So it's also for high touch donors and mass communications. So understanding me, like obviously I mentioned kids in education, that's me personally, but there's other organizations that I'll talk about later, they're focusing on a wider range of all parents going to do specific programming for kids, um, you know, for parents who have kids, right? So there's individual understanding, but also in a much broader setting. Um, relevancy being, you know, relevant right now, and the bottom line being, um, you know, simply put the right offer to the right people for the right reasons at the right time. So it's all kind of being as effective as you possibly can um, at scale. So it's a really exciting time to sort of bring all this data to sort of be used in all the traditional media um, ways as well as social. Okay, so at a high level view, how this happens, so taking a, a sort of fast forward view of this, the social CRM world is where you're kind of talking about three, four years ago. That's managing Facebook and Twitter and the relationships and growing the community there. The CRM system historically has obviously been uh, folks like Blackbot and others who help fundraising, help it sort of be structured in the right way. The challenge with opportunity is right here in the middle. We'll talk about what's going on in this cloud. How do you take this unstructured information that changes data plus a very structured system that needs to have a strong accounting focus. So all these different types of things, you have to sort of have this cloud-based system to, to work and scale to do that, whether a small organization or very large, all the same. Okay. How this generally works, um, sorry, the email is that key point of contact. Making that bridge, that data connection between the CRM system and the social world really happens through the email path. So when data is collected about people to build profiles, which is the first step, the email really generates opportunity to learn where this person is. So I'm a small act guy on Twitter, I'm you know, Casey Golden, obviously, um, on LinkedIn, and different sort of ways to understand me. That's my presence, that's my whole being, and so the email is the path. And there's a database that those all go into, so it kind of combines to a composite record, which you'll see, as well as you know, using that for one-time um, output, depends. So the process is going from email, gather social, and then bring it back to something that you can go back into your CRM system. Okay. Um, the concept here is just an example. So instead of an email for me, there's a lot more for you to know. Right? I'm an entrepreneur. I right? love philanthropy. Um, you know, you look sort of in my profile. I have a little Yorkie. That's my Yorkie right there, right? Um, kids in education, that's much more than an email. 
So thinking about how, this is an individual, so you can look at this in a major donor way, but also as a scalable way um, and for mass communications. So this is where we actually work with Blackbaud to develop a um, key influencer scoring. And there's some really interesting ways that that was developed to take all this information and build it into practical ways that organizations can actually implement it. Um, the reason so I'll transition over to, to Mark to talk about this. Great. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Mark Davis of BlackBot, Director of Product Marketing. So uh, I've actually been working with Casey and Danielle here for quite some time and um, actually very pleased that last year we launched, uh, or actually we released a white paper on this subject to, to kind of summarize this. I actually want to do a real quick audience participation here. So we're going to start. Show of hands, okay? And keep your hands up as long as you meet the criteria I'm saying. So how many of you guys are on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn? Okay, okay everybody's here. Okay, great. This, this, this is a little bit more, it's a little bit of a different kind of audience than I'm usually doing this feature, so there'll be a lot of hands at the end, but still, stick with me for a second, So I'm trying to make a point. Okay, how many of you are on all three? Okay, a couple people left. All right, how many of you have, would consider you have more than a thousand followers across all three? All right, so look around, you know, you're back down to about half there. Now, how many of the rest of you are tweeting or posting at least, say, ten times a day and have more than five thousand followers? Okay, now look around a little bit. Okay, actually, I'm not one of those, so I'm lying. Okay, so that whole exercise is basically what we've tried to do in partnership with Small Black, that Blackbaud's tried to do, to, to standardize and set up some sort of form or fashion where organizations can take what is an immense amount of social data that's available and standardize it into easy to understand segments. So part of the white paper was basically assessing those segments and also audience participation, who loves infographics? Yeah, we provided a quick infographic from which all of the slides here come. And um, what we've tried to do there, as I said before, is to make the data accessible and usable not just by social geeks and individuals who can really live this all, you know, live this information all day long, but to make it available for and make it uh, more usable for fundraisers, marketers, major gift officers, and other folks who may not necessarily know the ins and outs of social data, but you can put it into a form or fashion, a simple segmentation that people can understand. So basically what we've done is we've created a, um, four different segments uh, that basically measure individuals in their terms of their amount of connectivity and or influence they have with other individuals. Uh, so to summarize it, we basically have uh, starts with the key influencers, engagers, multi-channel consumers, and standard consumers. And uh, the infographic and the slides I'll show kind of break those all down. But to summarize, as you can imagine, the key influencers are the tip of the pyramid. So think of it, we didn't want to do the standard fundraising pyramid, so we kind of did it on its side here. So that's the big change we did to kind of really show the differences between the fundraising pyramid and the social uh, pyramid. But the key influencers represent about 1%, basically, of a standard population. Uh, and this is based off of uh, numerous examples of organizations that Small Act and Blackwater worked on. So it's basically the benchmark. We've actually gone across multiple uh, verticals. We've kind of seen this. Be, um, be kind of a standard. The next group of engagers kind of represent about 5%. So that's 6% of the total population are within engagers and key influencers. These are two very critical classifications and groups that, that I'll, I'll talk to in a, in a second. The rest of the group are split across what are called multi-channel and standard consumers. This is the vast majority of the population of, of individuals in your database. Um, and, but there's different ways to communicate and engage these individuals through social media, uh, as you'll see. So, without further ado, why don't we go right into the key influences. Again, a fantastic uh, little chart there in the picture with the infographic. But I'll summarize it. At 1% of your uh, population, the key influences are that last group of us who were raising your hands. These are individuals with a significant ability to influence a very broad range of individuals in your database. Um, how do you make this useful, right? Just even understanding and knowing who within your database are these key influencers is very critical. As you'll see with the two examples, we have two organizations up here who are doing a fantastic way. Um, if you know this individual has such a, uh, has such a wide ranging influence over people, how would you communicate with them differently? If you're an advocacy organization, could you have them take action? Could you, could you ask them to promote some sort of information or new study you have or, or actually have them promote on your behalf? with their influence, uh, with, with, within their circle of influence. <laughs> these are all the types of things we're talking about. Within the P2P world, within the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising world, could you ask these individuals to become team captains or volunteers to help you with your, with your one-walk ride type of event? 
Um, these individuals and finding these individuals and cultivating them are very critical it relates to going out and actually building out your own social networks. They become natural recruiters, they can recruit other individuals, and I think a term that Casey likes to use are citizen journalists. These are individuals, because they're influencers, they're always hungry for information. So one of the things that you'll see in the examples from Karen and WF is that they're cultivating these people to become uh, almost like an extension uh, of a high-level volunteer extension within their own organization to actually uh, feed them up, feed them with information that they can ultimately build out their own influence. Um, the next group are engagers. These are individuals who have the strongest connection immediately within their immediate circles. The key influencers have a broad connection. These, these are people that you follow greatly, but you're not, you're not necessarily their, their best friends. Engagers, um, actually, they, they, they communicate very broadly and, and, and actually uh, represent about, uh, I forget the exact number, about 85% of your content? Yeah, they, they generate a significant amount of content on social networks. Uh, they are all, generally speaking, on all three networks. Um, and they have a strong influence on the people they directly connect. They don't have as broad of an influence as key influencers do, but they have a strong connection to those people who are their Facebook friends and ultimately people that are following them. So, uh, and actually in their own right, we found a lot of data that shows these individuals, generally speaking, are wealthier. So from a fundraising perspective, engagers are a great, uh, are great um, um, target from a fundraising perspective, uh, whether it's from a major campaign, major gift campaign, or sustainable type of campaign. They're also highly trusted as well. A lot of the content they generate, uh, because they have that strong connection with their uh, immediate connections, uh, on, on their social networks. They're also, the content that they, de they generate is highly trusted, which a lot of studies show that individuals are making buying decisions, e-commerce decisions, less based off of uh, the actual, uh, the actual um, uh, producer uh, of, of the actual, uh, uh, they're making decisions, excuse me, they're making buying decisions more and more based off of other individuals' opinions on products nowadays. So that connection, uh, engagers can really, if they, if they actually are out there and they're talking about your product, which is basically your mission in your organization, they're going to have a strong level of influence to make other people make potentially buying decisions, such as making a donation. The last two groups, multi-channel consumers and standard consumers, are on the, uh, the other end of the pyramid. Uh, Multi-channel consumers are generally speaking on uh, one or two, uh, actually two or more uh, networks with Facebook and Twitter or LinkedIn and Twitter depending on how they may ha happen to be using the social networks. They don't have a as great of an influence as the previous two groups, but they're consuming a lot of information. These are the people that your influencers and your engagers can actually have an impact on. So through those, those individuals, you can reach these multi-channel consumers because they are actually actively following the engagers and the... Uh, thank you, multi-channel consumers. So as you'll see, a lot of the examples in terms of NWF and CARE is that uh, using the segment, these are individuals you can reach out to through social media, but they're not, they won't necessarily have a lot of direct influence on other individuals. And last but certainly not least are standard consumers. These are individuals who are typically just on one network. They may be on Facebook just to basically connect with their friends, or they may be on LinkedIn for their professional development or so good. They're not necessarily uh, consuming a massive amounts of information and therefore uh, not as directly impacted through social media as the other groups, uh, but they're definitely, social media is still a way to connect, connect with them. So clearly with all this information, um, you can begin to understand how you may interact with some of these groups, such as the engaged the key influencers, based off of the relative impact they may have in terms of the relationship with other people down the chain. So this, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but nonetheless, you can see you as an organization, you have a certain level of impact you have throughout the pyramid in terms of all the individuals. <coughs> However, you look on the bottom half of that presentation, you can see that the engagers and the consumers actually have a stronger correlation. So empowering them to reach out to their friends and family through social networks is definitely going to be the key to a certain amount of success. Okay, actually, a lot of this information, including a couple of case studies, are available in the white paper we talked about it before. I actually don't have a slide up in here, but if memory serves, it's downloaded at blackpod.com slash social-influencers. Social-influencers. Blackpod.com slash social-influencers. All right, so I think I'm all done, and I'm going to hand it over to Daniel.
Our first case there. Uh, that's all. Hi. 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 Hi.
you know, is social matter, what gift level. Um, and this is one in particular was interesting because it's not about sort of necessarily going and becoming Facebook friends or tweeting them, but it's about how much you can learn. Of these people you need to build a quick relationship with, how do you get to know them, what's important for them, relevant for them, as quick as possible, and, and to pair with this, to look, uh, to, they put out a report that by 2020, the number of millionaires will double. So this particular sort of high asset, high value group, they're gonna become more and more digital, which means you have more access to, to get to know them, to make your conversation, whether it's a, over a phone or an in-person meeting or just an email, that much more persuasive and, and making sure that your mission is relevant to their life. So that's so, so the way I look at it is, you know, we have these great donors, supporters. I actually pretty much look at everybody similarly, um, but I want to have that context, like whether it's historical or not, when I'm engaging with them on social media. You know, I want to know whether or not they are a donor or whether or not they've ever heard of NWS, so I'm not introducing them to a new organization that they've been a part of for 20 years. Um, so we'll talk about that. So um, I made this all fancy and it's overwhelming. Um, you know. so, so basically, here are some of the ways that we started to use it. Um, and we definitely, for me in particular, because I manage the social media um, side of things, I always have that angle. So that's the angle you're gonna get from me, unfortunately. I wish I had more knowledge on the fundraising aspect. Um, but what you can see is, you know, we, we're constantly looking at, okay, there's, there's so much out there, how do we make sense of it? And most importantly, how do we use it to allocate resources, to engage with our supporters in a more respectful way, um, and to think about smart ways to use it so that we're more effective at accomplishing our mission, right? Um, and so we did that in a couple ways, you know. It, the example that we left off here, and I, I have some photos, I swear. Um, <laughs> are you know, looking at what people are passionate about, right? Um, what do they care about? What gets them up uh, every morning? And a lot of it's birding and, and stuff like that, but it's also stuff we can't guess, right? But that they're actively telling us on these social networks. Um, you know, and so I would actually group people based on that. The other thing was whenever there was a crisis, um, we partnered with somebody that a lot of our supporters didn't appreciate, and so they complained about us. And sometimes they got really mean, but um, when I looked them up, they weren't actually ever a member of ours, so they were just joining in on the anger. Um, but then there were also times where there were legitimate people who supported us in the past and who were really upset with us. And so taking a look at that and really kind of weighing um, how to respond that way. Um, and there are photos, so we'll go into it. Um, the other thing, and it, you know, you guys can read, so I won't read this, um, but really figuring out how to report back on that. You know, how many members did I talk to this month? How many? You know, how many unsubscribed um, catalog users did I, did I have a conversation with? I mean, those are the kinds of things that can help you figure out, you know, is social a valuable, well, I mean, hopefully you think that on some level, but um, how can social support the rest of the organization in a way that's real and provide them data that we otherwise wouldn't gather or we would pay a lot of money to get, you know? Um, the way I see my job is very much like air traffic control. Um, it shouldn't stop with me. <laughs> it should really be about um, passing it off to where they, they, so these people want to go. Um, and if our organization can suffice and help them with that, then that's what I want to do. Um, and then, you know, trying to integrate it with other campaigns that we're doing, be smart about it, um, and really think through, you know, okay, there's all this data. And, and my big fear with doing any kind of experiment like this is not having kind of a plan and a way to execute. I'm all about actionable data, right? Don't just look at like your data set and be like, all right, I did a good job, I have a spreadsheet. Um, but really think about you know, what, um, what you're doing with it. Um, and that's something that I think takes us all the time, and so you have, to, you have to make sure you have the capacity to take on a project like this, which sometimes I'm not sure I do with it. Um, and then you know, monitoring long-term effects, and, and I'll go into that a little bit. So um, these were just a couple of ways and ideas we started playing with it. Um, you know, obviously, because I'm the social media manager, I was very excited about a, a content, uh, or I mean, a relationship management tool that allowed me to see our history with people. You know, um, beyond just previous tweets, but oh wow, they used to get Ranger Rick magazine, but now they don't anymore. So how can I jump in there and mention, you know, the fact that I know they like Ranger Rick at least, or they have an awareness of it, allows me to target them a little bit better, even if it's just, hey, I think you might like this article or something. Um, we also did an employer mashing, which is, again, out of my purview, but um, really looking at the people on LinkedIn who have 
the opportunity to match their donations. That's, that's another strategic way you can do it. Um, and then, you know, seeing how the gifts increase and, and seeing how we can sustain gifts over time by having people uh, donate monthly. Um, all these things are, are some ways that we wanted to dive into it. And then looking at local events, because especially with social media, that's one of those times where, um, you know, NWF's a national organization. We don't do as much on the ground um, as we used to. And local events provide an offline, online experience that's unique, um, but that allows you to test this stuff. So, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the green ball. So, um, so what I was really excited about, as I said, was integrating this stuff. You know, I think. I think it's so important to be respectful of supporters and, and donors, um, but you can't always do that if you have a crappy database or if you, if you aren't taking the time to take care of your data. Um, and the nice thing about social media is that it does a lot of that for you because they're updating their content. Um, and, and more and more we're seeing people are a little bit more comfortable with this. This is actually a snapshot of us um, and just highlighting one of our supporters um, who's who's an activist, a member, and has participated in Great American Backyard Campout. And it shows you, I don't know if you guys can see it back there, but um, it shows you kind of some of the previous history with them. Um, and it allows me to kind of see what they've been involved in with us. Um, and, it, and I see those tags when I'm interacting with them on Twitter. So it just helps me know, okay, who is this person to us? You know, if they have that context with us, how can I you know, thank them in a meaningful way and take that extra moment to, to actually matter to them. So, really integrating social media, you know, my, my title is a little ridiculous, it's a little long, it's Senior Manager of Social Strategy and Integration, but that integration piece is really what I care most about because as social media is more and more ubiquitous, um, I wanted to start impacting places and, and allowing us to allocate resources that way. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Gets <laughs> me. Okay. <laughs> He's so fancy. Okay. Um, so, so one of the things. So we recently started these uh, hike and seek events, and they were, um, you know, they're growing each year. Uh, we started off doing three. Now we're doing, or we did six, and I think we're upping it to eleven or so. Um, but one of the neat things about having a tool uh, to really analyze this stuff was to be able to target by region and find people who have previously engaged with Hike and Seek and just talk to them, just see what they were doing, see how they liked the event, see if they were going to blog about it this year. Um, and because I, I kind of, it gave me a starting point, right? It doesn't actually, it's not the end of my job, certainly, but it gave me a place to start and to find new people. So um, this is just an example of that. Uh, and, and figuring out key influencers. I will say this about key influencers. Sometimes they're the busiest. And I find that actually mixing them with other people is the best way to go. Um, we formed a group of mommy, I hate the word mom, okay, mom, mother bloggers. Um, and and they, we asked them for, for help and they've just been very supportive. Um, but one of the things that we did was we mixed some of the key influencers with people who just were like one out with passion about the subject and they inspired each other. And I just think that using key influencers sparingly is a good good way to go because they are busy and you know you really want to save them up um, but you can do that you can you know there are certainly lots of social media tools that you can find them and engage with them um, so anyway we picked you know a couple of our chapters and we, and we did outreach to them based on social work and, um, you know I, I'm not sure how exciting this is for you I see like a lot of um, you know, sleepy eyes um, but but the point is it's cool stuff right we've got this event we're working on trying to improve the way we do our outreach on social media, but on top of that, we're trying to add to our database to know, really know, is this an event that we want to spend our resources on? Is it doing exactly what we want it to do for our mission? And, and how can we use social data to inform us on that? Because otherwise, you know, we can guess and say, yeah, it worked really well. And we can look at um, other things, but this kind of stuff is pretty cool. Um, and then the other thing that I would do is I would compare how people were using and, and engaging around our content around Hike and Seek. So this is just an example. We had a hashtag Hike and Seek, but a, lot of, but a number of people continued to just spell it out. Um, and just paying attention to the different ways people engage around your content um, can, be, can, can be fun. It really can. Because sometimes, um, you know, they're just, they come up with new ways to talk about it, new ways to, to help you think about your own programs. 
All right, so, um, so this is just an example. One of our key influencers um, who was active in New Jersey, um, you know, pulling up her, her profile and letting me get a chance to, to know her. It's a little creepy, I realize. Um, but it's, it's for good. Um, yeah, creepy for good. <laughs> that should be a sticker. Um, but no, I really was just about money. So she actually, if you dig a little bit deeper, she ran, runs something called Kinder Chat. Um, she's very engaged on social media. And so getting her to talk about hike and seek on Kinder Chat or finding those things where we can be mutually um, beneficial to one another, I think is really what my goal is. It's like, I don't want you to just do what I want you to do. I want you to make it your own thing. I want you to run with it. I want you to like it. Um, and if not, we're doing our job wrong, right? Um, so anyway, this is kind of the, a good example of, of how I would just, I, I honestly just went through and quickly direct message to quite a few of these people and just said, hey, I saw you participate in Hike and Seek last year. You know, what did you think? And just, you know, start the conversation. And it did not take me very much time, um, but it was because this is such a small niche uh, community that I was able to do that. I know <laughs> you run large events and you could never do that, and that's okay. Um, but that's just one example. Uh, the other thing is we, so this year, um, there was the inaugural free, or there were inaugural balls everywhere. <laughs> funny to say. Um, and one of the things that we did was we, NWF helped run the inaugural green ball in DC. Um, and so they came to me because we were going to have it at the museum. And, you know, there are giant screens everywhere. And I was like, let's do social for this. And I'm like, well, nobody cares about events social wise unless you're at them. Um, but what our idea was, was to have people submit green wishes. So every, everyone cares about the future, hopefully. Um, and so having people submit green wishes that could be displayed throughout the museum during the ball was one of our ideas. Um, and, and so what we did was we asked for them, we got you know, several hundred of them and then um, displayed them throughout the, the thing. But, uh, um, but the hope was to really enlighten the atmosphere there but also get people who maybe didn't want to drop a lot of money on a green ball to come and participate. Um, so what was cool about this was that um, people actually did it. Sometimes I, I have ideas and nobody actually does it. Um, <laughs> that makes me sad, but it's just true. Um, but what was neat was that, so people used the event hashtag, which was Green Ball 2013, and people used the Green Wish hashtag to, to say things like, I hope you know we take better care of our ecosystems, or you know, and they they were very broad. Some of them were really specific, like I hope we save pelicans there. Sure, but um, but the cool thing was Joe Biden actually showed up, and then he shared with us his green wish, and that was really uh, a neat experience. Um, but the whole point of this was to really figure out how do we engage people offline and online, and how can we continue this relationship, right? Um, so I actually gave Casey a bunch of stuff. I was like, Casey, take it. Um, and he, he took a look at our green ball attendees and how they were active on social media, where they fell in that um, realm of um, you know, channels, multi-channel givers, engagers, influencers. And this was the distribution he found. So obviously standard consumers, they, they will always make up a large percentage um, and multi-channel, and it kind of it makes sense. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I don't know, if I, if I miss anything, you just jump in. Um, but basically what we found was that uh, there were a higher level, compared to the average, higher level of engagers and, and key influencers for people who were active on social at this event. And, and what that told us, um, among many things, was that um, this event was a good thing to have social media at because otherwise, one, we wouldn't know kind of the people we were engaging with, but also how we can continue building these relationships with these people. Um, so anyway, this is, chart, see? <laughs> um, look at it. Uh, so, I mean, the whole idea behind this is I really want to prove um, that we can use social to allocate resources, like I said, um, but also make it valuable for the whole organization. And sometimes that takes time, and we're still not where um, I would love us to be, but I think that um, it's really neat when you can find ways to integrate social into your otherwise um, established campaigns. Um, you know, I think most people, if you said, yeah, having a green ball is a good way to get people engaged with your organization, I think that they probably understand on some level that that, that would be true, that that would be the case. But, um, but I think having this data to back it up and say, no, what we're doing is we're providing an experience for people who will then have the ability to go out and share it and tell it and you know, bring it to other places. 
Um, so the another thing we're doing um, is going forward, I've added them to our contacts, um, and I actually created also a separate green ball attendees list on Twitter. And I'm just kind of like keeping track of them, engaging with them every so often, and we're gonna compare it to our donor files um, to see if they continue to stay engaged with us. Um, this picture does not actually represent that, it's just showing you how you can add contacts um, within Thrive, but I mean, you can add a Twitter list, you can create a Facebook list. I mean, this concept of tracking social users is, is not a new one, um, but it's one that I, I'm very interested in. I also had, I have a, a PhD um, genius guy come and help me, and he actually analyzed the pronoun use of all the green ball users, because I have like all the tweets. Um, and that's really fascinating stuff. If anyone wants to talk about that, also um, find me, because I love it. Um, but yeah, looking at how people were s talking about the green ball as they were at the green ball was really interesting. Um, and just you know how we were actually um, engaging with them and, and figuring out ways. Not as many complaints as, as we thought, so that was good. Um, so I mean, that's the initial piece. I, and I, I definitely want to take questions if you have any, but I'm not sure. We're doing that at the end, or if you have any, cool. So think of them or tweet them at me, and uh, and you know I look forward to geeking out. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, my name is Ken Bess with uh, Care, and I am officially the manager of web development. Thank you, Casey, for inviting me to be here today. Really excited. It's my first time speaking, so a little nervous, but. Bear with me. And um, I am going to go a little different, maybe, and actually show kind of like what um, what this stuff really looks like, because um, we think it's incredible. So um, uh, this is just a little quick. Like uh, we are. Uh, Started with the how we started with Small Act and kind of where we're going. Right now, we're really kind of just getting a lot of our, our programs going, and I'll explain why and some of that and and how we're uh, kind of bringing in other other areas of the organization to really utilize the stuff. Um, and then kind of going big with how we're doing it with email and how we're doing some um, some certain things in social as well right now. And I'll talk briefly about like some tools, techniques, and what I do. Um, some wrap up here. So I am um, quickly about me. Um, I'm a manager and a developer. I'm a coder. I'm a data geek, if you will. Um, I manage to be illuminate online, and we have um, and I do a lot of stuff um, externally with um, Drupal, PHP, Ruby, and uh, I've been doing this for um, my first. Touch with the nonprofit was '92 with the Georgia Kids County and Data, data Project for the for the state of Georgia, and um, been doing something data driven from '95. So there we go. So a little bit about us at Care. Um, you know, a lot of people think that this kind of stuff is only really for big organizations, and I just want to say, I mean, we're four people, so you know, it's like I, I feel like anybody can really do this and, and really get a lot out of it. Um, and one of the real challenges for us at CARE is we actually have what I would call a kind of a broken setup where we have a separate online and a separate offline system and the, the, uh, so the, the online system actually feeds um, every night to the offline system. Uh, and we're working of course with Blackboard and some cool stuff with uh, Data Warehouse to that. So we got started um, last year with with Small Act as kind of like our own weird little um, web team project, if you will. And it was kind of like we saw a couple of the analysis, the, the reports themselves, and thought it was fantastic. And it was really kind of to justify some of our spend in web marketing and kind of get a better handle on like how we can maybe tweak some messaging and, and move people up into a higher uh, level of, of giving or go to a monthly sustainer program and then just kind of thinking like well with this model can we can we can we actually like 
just tweak our messaging and personalize our messaging in a more effective way. Um, and I'm happy to say that, um, you know, I, I, without a doubt, um, the, the, the small act report was just incredible for, for really bringing a lot of insight. Um, so about our data, this is real quick. Um, we have a little over um, half a million active emails. And then I mixed in the offline data. Again, this is kind of out of Donor Direct, uh, our online or offline system. And in the offline system, all the uh, accounts are householded. So you might have like one account that has 10 email accounts, all right, or you have five email accounts. But in Cambio, everybody have every account is tied directly to the email. So um, it gets a little tricky. And then we rolled in the last donors, and then we rolled in a bunch of um, Advo action taker data as well. So this is kind of how, um, what Casey brought back to us. And you'll see the benchmark there at 35%. We scored at 56%. When, and I mean, this really actually wasn't a, much of a surprise for us because we have an extremely engaged social audience. I mean, like everyone is, is really committed um, at CARE to, to really pushing our message. And this is kind of where I'm going to get a little crazy. But um, this is the actual data. So, so when, we, when we got all this back, So when we got this back, um, just just looking down the, it was kind of like just all of these. Um, uh, this is this, all of the. Um, how do I say this? So this is a an actual like this is like the live match, right? So this is ranked by social score, which is the small act scoring method, right? So this is our top, basically our top people that came back in the data. And it's, it, as you see here, it's really straightforward. So you have the social score, which I'm sorting on, and then the, the social type. We um, determine the gender, and then each one of these is the actual live link over to each one of the Facebook, I mean, each, each one of the social networks. So it's really, gets wild is when you start rolling in like the, the actual donation amounts and so you can look at like so I'm looking at here is these are the key influencers but a lot of them you see are real big donors so it's 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 kind of one of these things it's like it's not scary it's, it's like you just sit here and play with it you just sort this stuff because Casey and Small Axe really done a lot of this, the, the heavy lifting here. So, it, and this is in, um, actually this is in um, Excel. I mean, uh, this is in Access. So you just are just sorting these columns, basically. Um, and you see the number of actions. So we have like somebody here with a 17. Um, but what's, what's wild here is that it's, what I'm trying to say is it's like the data is really straightforward. And um, in each one of these, once you have these matches, you have them. So they don't really go away. Like people don't change and like really change their Facebook account. They just change their email associated with their with their Facebook account. So, but their Facebook account won't change. So the, the once the the connection's made, you got them. So this is our comparison across social networks. Um, and you'll see um, pretty much like, I mean, everyone I've seen um, with, with similar comparisons from Small Act, I mean, have very similar numbers. But these are um, our actual numbers from CARE. So you'll see the, the average lifetime money is significantly larger on LinkedIn, which was a huge insight for us, actually, because we weren't really doing a whole lot with LinkedIn. Um, 
And LinkedIn also has some really interesting connections, and, it, and it's kind of back to those connections, because you have, when you have the match, um, you, you have a huge advantage. So it's like you have, let's say, a, a hit on somebody in Facebook and LinkedIn, you know way more about them when you make the connection between Facebook and LinkedIn. I mean, and I'll get, I'll get some, more, some more of that in a second. So we have, uh, and then the average single gift here, um, you'll see it as well, same kind of trend. So 123 for LinkedIn, down to 90 for Facebook. Um, this is kind of a classic um, big chart of, you like, you can see each one of these channels. I mean, when people are socially engaged, they give more, you know, it's, it's really straightforward. Um, this is the, and these are the segments basically that we worked out with Small Act. So, um, out of our half a million people, uh, you'll see the all Facebook members, 233,000. Um, but there's some really interesting ones here that we were actually able to, to, to churn out here. And um, like uh, the matching people basically, like through matching with LinkedIn data, we have determined that there's 41,000 people out there that are, you know, we can go out and approach for a matching gift program that we're currently not doing. So, um, the advocacy stuff too is really interesting to me because these people tend to, you know, they're, they're really involved with us, but they tend not to donate. Um, and it's like, how do we, how do we change that messaging and, and who, who, who are those people? Um, so like I said, this kind of started as a Skunkworks project in, in the web team, and it's, um, it's almost like it's gotten, it's gotten to be so good with the data coming back that we've decided like, well, how do we kind of roll this out in the organization? And the approach that I'm going with is to bring in our major giving people, what are called relationship managers. And it's more of a, um, it's a situation where we're almost just trying to change their mindset because in, at our organization, and I'm sure many of yours as well, that if, unless, so many people think unless you're a donor, you're not worth going after. And it's, it's changing this mindset that, that these key influencers and engagers really are worth going after. So, and you can see like here, I have, this is, these are our, what I did here is, I took a, my, um, all the people that were relationship managed, which is about 5,000 people, and then did a join with data back to the social data, and I came up with 522 people matched here. So you can see, and then I rank them by social score. So you can see the first one here is a $175 donor. This is lifetime now. One of them is, or basically our number three person here is um, never given us anything. And then the, the next one has given us 241,000. So my point is, like every one of these people are a little different and it's kind of rare actually that you have somebody that's given us that amount of, I mean they're really connected with us as a key influencer and they're a major donor so it, it's it's kind of cool to see that person but you know it's making the point that the person that has given zero is just as important and they probably need just a different messaging you know and and really the idea here is you want to you want to you want to engage them in a different way. Like you want them to have all of your materials. You look, you want them to amplify your voice. So go out there with all of your stuff, all of your stuff digital. Print copies of your annual reports, and, and just let them let them expand um, through their networks, um, and and basically amplify your own work. Um, So yeah, the, the social score to me is like, it's awesome. <laughs> All right, next I'm gonna talk about email. This is like, for the people that, I mean, this is the bulk of our world at CARE. I mean, we push out two million emails a month and 
if a campaign is not does not have an email element, it fails. Um, as simple as that. And it's like the idea here is how do we utilize the social data to to either drive more donations um, or drive our kind of viral tendencies of our email, like so spreading the word or getting or coming back, taking an advo action, coming back um, and, and and just looking at our materials. So we're using Comvio, and this is just to kind of show you um, we're doing this is a, this is our new thing where we're actually building groups and then emailing specific messaging and personalized messaging to different groups based on their social score. And the way to go about this really to, to, to make it effective is what's called an A-B test. And Convio does this, a lot of people can do this. Um, and even if you can't do this, if you're a small organization, you know, just split your lists and half of them message and then the other half the other and, and see, you know, how many, how many, um, Kind of responses you get. It's really straightforward. Um, this is our action compared by social type. So we see this kind of this is this is again kind of mirrors what everyone said earlier, where it's just like the key influencers. I mean, their 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 range is just amazing compared. All right, and this is um, this is another new thing that we're doing, and this is kind of involves Facebook um, directly. We're we're testing um, how we can modify uh, the messaging in Facebook itself, or in our advertising in Facebook, to better um, to 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 engage the um, the various people in, in, a, in a more um, personalized and, and, and powerful manner through, through these groups. So what, what this is, is um, actually a Chrome plugin called the Facebook Power Editor. And you just go get it if you have an advertising account um, with Facebook. And you build what's called a custom audience. And only certain people in that audience will see that message. So it's really straightforward, highly recommend it, and we do extremely well with Facebook ads and have from the start. Um, so if you're doing any of that, I highly recommend that and, and doing those custom audience. Um, and, and this kind of goes on um, kind of where this data should live. And for us, like I said, with our systems being like two separate things, I can't put really like the, the the richness of the social data in my Convio Luminate online CRM. I mean, it it because it, it's just. I mean, I can I, I know if somebody like comes through with like a, a social sign-in that it'll do a linked account, but I can't really store these these links as well as I want. And it and the, my important thing is like I, I think it's is it, you're going to see this trend over and over. It's like you're you're going to once you have these these matches. Um, you know, the connections are, are, are way more important really than just the email addresses. So this stuff really should live somewhere and, and let it flourish. And, and you can't just throw it into your offline systems that only certain people can get at and, and expect for people to, to utilize it. So um, a simple thing, like, like if you have a, a, a great CRM, you just create a, a, you know, some custom fields for the, and actually put the URL in. That's the, my recommendation by far. Um, and you want this to, um, you want this stuff to, to, to grow, and you want to be able to kind of manipulate it. So if you like, you get a listing from um, from a different department, or if you've got a new program going on, and you want to you want to be able to match back to the social data. And so you want, in my opinion, you, know, you really need to keep expanding this database and, and keep it in a database structure. So here's some you know, quick suggestions on this is what I use basically with my SQL, SQL 3. And then you have, those are the engines, and then you have a kind of manipulation tools like SQL Pro. Um, 
or you can go access with Microsoft SQL Server Express and FileMaker. That's it for me. Thank you, everyone. more stuff we'll cover, but you had a question? So just, to, so just repeat the question she was asking about the comparison of Facebook, LinkedIn, and Google Ads, and if it had any sort of experience across those. Um, we're personally, we're just really focusing on Facebook ads right now. Uh, to us, like Twitter is just ridiculously expensive for what we want to do. Uh, LinkedIn is kind of what we're, where we're looking at. Uh, but yeah, I don't have enough data to make a good analysis. Great, we'll get to some questions here in just a second. So um, just another, two, two more examples just really quickly. And so hopefully, um, you know, the example that gave it's, 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 an, it's an open territory, right? There's some really exciting things um, that are available. And we'll talk a little bit about um, how organizations can, can do that. So another example, just to kind of like, you know, open up the creative door is TPT, the PBS affiliate out of St. Louis. What they want to do is build a better telemarketing campaign, right? There's, you know, it's a non-social thing, but what they're doing is they're using social um, intelligence and listening, social data, to find those on their telemarketing list who are actually parents, right? Why is that important? Because on that call, they're gonna talk about Curious George and Wildcrats and Martha Speaks and all those things that are relevant to that audience and really worthwhile for engagement for those parents like myself um, versus the other type of programming, right? So it's using social information to modify and enhance other existing programs. So that's one um, that they're doing um, as well. And then um, kind of similar to what Ken was describing as well, WGBH out of Boston, something similar, right? Where they're, they're actually using Marketo to sort of manage these sort of like, it's an iterative, it's much more than A-B testing, um, which is really high end, but what they're doing is they're modifying the subject line and body content. Um, you know, do you include Facebook sort of links or actually a picture of the Facebook? Um, image, like all these different sort of iterations for people who are on Facebook, right? Versus those who are on Twitter being more of an emphasis there. So they're really sort of doing some high scale modifications. Um, the end goal though is just to improve email performance, right? So what can you know about certain people segmentation wise or where they like to um, communicate and network to sort of enhance the likelihood that they'll be engaged with you, okay? All right, so the future. Um, for organizations of all sizes, um, the, the vision is that enabling you in a way that's never been possible before to simply understand your donors at scale without the work, right? We work with you know, organizations that are three people in total, right? And obviously much larger organizations than that. So um, going forward, um, this is our tool that we uh, launched at the conference here um, called Social Vision. Um, and really trying to make it simple, um, where you can simply drag and drop a file, right, of your donors onto the interface, and it'll actually sort of do the profiling for you, right? So in an instant, it'll, it'll you know, go through all them and try to help you understand, but it doesn't really stop at just, here's the data. Um, to Ken's point, one of the most powerful ways that it can actually be in use, practically, is building segments. So in addition to this, I know we've in people who are high potential sustainers, right? Team, captain, potentials, um, local executive committee member prospects. So those types of things that are relevant just for nonprofits, that it, it's a much shorter list, much easier to manage, as it even as a small uh, nonprofit or large, um, really helping organizations. So this is just an example of what you should be expecting, whether it's from us or somebody else, um, going forward, a really easy way to implement and learn more about your people. Um, and in things like this, there's where you can actually um, do dynamic searches, where you can actually search for anybody who describes himself as, let's say, an entrepreneur, right? You can just type that in the keyword search and it'll go across your database to find anybody who self-describes himself as one or discusses entrepreneurship types of issues, right? Or parents or kids are running. So other organizations who are doing run, walk, ride stuff, looking for athletes, right? Who might want to do their um, butt runs or things like that. So really trying to understand the right audience for whichever type of campaign you're going to run. Um, the other nice thing is, is, as Ken was saying, the information is all over the place, so what you're able to do is bring together event history, giving history, all those types of things, and use that built into your query, right, your segment of who you're trying to find for what reasons. Okay. 
Um, so where to get started? A um, couple things um, that I would suggest. Um, certainly, um, because we're at the conference, everybody can start for free. It's like a Dropbox account. Everybody knows Dropbox, right? Okay. So the same way, you get your sort of free thousand accounts. Okay. So you just go in, drag and drop your thousand, and get started and start playing. Because a lot of the creativity comes when you have something to work with, right? And so that's what we're doing to support the nonprofit industry, both small and large organizations, who can get started. So if you go there and sign up. Um, we'll get you started with um, something just to play with because whichever way you go, whatever decisions you make, uh, they should be informed, right? How's it going to help our organization to make better decisions, whatever we can, can do? Um, and one of the areas, there's a lot of things, even with um, the NWF and in care, there's so much opportunity, but focusing on one thing first, right? So for Ken, the major gifts was the first area to sort of get that out of the database into practical use. Um, and the other part is, is really emphasizing what we found is it's so what's in it for me, so whether it's the uh, major gift folks or it's the membership director, um, whatever it is, how are we going to help them do a better job with whatever campaign they're running is sort of like kind of going up the chain to help them find more relevancy in, in why it should matter and why they want to invest time. Okay. All right, so now we'll get to questions. Yep. Have you worked with any companies yet who have tried pending and using your information on just part of their file so they can test over time whether it really helps their um, fundraising and other metrics? Great question. So I was asking, you know, have, have we worked with organizations that just append part of the file so they'll have like a, a base case versus the sort of one that has been appended? Not yet, but I'd be excited to talk to you about that. Um, no, but, but for real, it, it's, it's so new. Um, people have done test files, but not in a sort of empirical, sort of test-driven way. Um, so there's been, been tests, but not in a sort of um, way that could actually calculate the significance. Yes. doing was not exactly oh sorry um, I stand um, the question was have I been able to prove any revenue lift um, by doing the analysis that I did do um, which I think the example that you're talking about are the hike and seek examples when I like actually went through so I didn't see a revenue lift but that's largely because we are still very segmented and you know like, I, that's just not what I see directly um, but what I did see were, were blogs that came out of it. Um, so I could prove that, you know, even just talking to them, whether it prodded them or not, you know, I think we had maybe five or six blogs that I don't know if they would have existed or not. Um, but again, I'm talking like, so there are a couple unfortunate things. One, what I did was not exactly scientific. It was very much like a traditional outreach, like, hey, I've got 15 minutes. I'm going to direct message a few people who I know wouldn't be offended if I direct message them. Um, and, and I think going forward with the support of the organization a little bit more, I'd be able to be more scientific and then look on the back end. That's kind of what we're doing with Greenball, actually. What we're trying to do is, is in a few months, see if, if we put out an ask and they've been socially engaged, if there will be more. So stay in touch. I, I know we'll talk. But um, the, I think that's kind of what I'm hoping will, will happen. That being said, I have other goals you know, kind of going back, whether or not they donate, if they're engaged with us, I mean, that matters. And I think that's one thing that's interesting and maybe unique to social media, but it's your supporters aren't necessarily just, they're, they're your supporter when they think they're your supporter. So going back to like when I was saying, well, some people said they were a donor and they weren't. Well, yeah, that's true, but I, I still put a lot of um, clout into, or I mean, I put a lot of power into people who think they're part of us, you know, and I think we all should, but, um, coming back and, and really kind of making it more scientific is what I'd like to do. Casey kind of like watches me stumble around and, and do my outreach a little bit more targeted, but it's not um, as scientific as it, I wish it were. So. And just um, quick comment. Um, quick comment. I know um, Ken, um, <coughs> um, doing the Facebook advertisement or talking downstairs just about how that's much more instant, right? And there's certainly, I mean, they're continuing to invest more and more um, on that, so I don't know if there's anything material there, but like every um, targeted segment that they sort of 
uses data to sort of go after has been very successful. Um, you know, um, dollar for dollar, it's, it's a very, very good initiative for them. So, I, re I really like the idea of doing that with email. Like, I, I've, I've definitely heard of, of groups and a lot of people doing it where, um, you know, and you guys could do this if you don't know who to engage. You could either use your top email engaged audience to, to have them analyzed, or you could even do a test where you're like, do you follow us on Facebook? Um, and then take the people who click through that and, and engage with them, and just, just so that you know. I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of ways you can do that, but I love um, you know, his take on that. I just think that's smart. Yeah. Great. Yes, question? So could you give me an example of a Facebook ad that you use that's been very successful? So, uh, she, she, I'll repeat. so she's just asking you know, an example of a Facebook ad that's been successful. The, what we're doing right now, um, as far as the Facebook, is looking at like with our with our um, custom audience of key influencers and engagers, is really kind of make the the message more kind of the next step of clicktivism, if you will. Like so, instead of just liking the post, um, kind of make it personal to a point where it's almost like, hey, we, we, we know who you are. Um, we appreciate what you're doing. You know, it's it getting that message across more in an ad. So make the ad like less offensive. And it's like, you, you know these people are already your people. So you don't, they don't need to be sold on your organization. So get, take them to the next level and, and have them really kind of go to the next step instead of just staying in Facebook go and take an ad go action, or go and sign a petition, or go and take a survey. You know, so it's, it's, it's kind of getting those, um, those kinds of calls, calls to action more um, with, the, with the top people. I can actually add to that. I manage the yeah. Facebook ads for care. Um, we've had the most luck with promoted posts. They just threw everything else out of the ballpark. Um, so we kind of, we decided which post to promote based on what the campaign is and what we're focusing on at the time. They always have a call to action, they always have an engaging photo. Um, and then sometimes we'll add, we'll promote the post and then in addition, we'll take the, we'll make, I forget what they're called, but like the Facebook ad out of the post. I forget, there's, there's another term for that. And then we'll segment them by specific audiences. So we actually have an audience made specifically of people on our email list. So send them to those and other audiences of people who we think would also be interested based on the other organizations they like are really We've had a lot of luck with that. Kira Stein. <laughs> <laughs> other questions? Everybody sort of data data driven? <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, yeah, so we do have some. I'll repeat the question. So his question was: um, Is the social scoring and other data that they're using related to any other sort of um, wealth scoring um, appends? Yeah, I mean, we have some appends that that have gone into our under direct system, and it's it's kind of it's, it's again a challenge because we can't really get at stuff. There's only a few, very limited number of people that can even kind of pull that out, so that's a great question. And kind of the way I'm trying to answer it is more of like um, the segmentations and basically taking and matching back to see, if, hey, if these people are, first of all, just uh, if we have a social match, but are they also in like the, the executive um, LinkedIn category and as far as the segments that, that Small Act built? So, you know, like kind of taking it down the line, like, and kind of getting the same, you know, kind of getting there a different way, but through social. Because of the, the knowing the title of somebody um, from, a, from a LinkedIn match is really good stuff. You know, I mean, simple as that. And, and it's like you would, not, you would not know a lot of that otherwise. So um, that's, uh, 
Um, so it's not really an overlay, so to speak, um, typically, but um, you, you can get there the same way. One of the things, yeah, so, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, so kind of my perspective on this, we've spent, and Casey and I have done a couple of tasks, we've kind of worked with a couple of organizations. A couple of examples, we, we mentioned in CARE's example of the correlation between total donation, giving to LinkedIn. Makes sense. If you're on LinkedIn, you, you care about your profession, likely if you have a profession, you have money, and if you have money, more likely you're likely to give, right? Kind of makes sense. Um, one of the other things we did, we, did, we worked with the university as well, taking a look at um, there are degrees, and we found that individuals who were key influencers, and using this example, they, they came from a certain degree category that happened to be journalism. Makes sense, right? Because individuals who are journalists likely have value in their profession. They're going to be key influencers. But uh, overall, the kind of overarching theme is we're beginning to see individuals, the correlation between uh, wealth and influence is, is becoming much stronger. And, and, that, and that in order for you to be successful nowadays, entrepreneurial, be successful in a lot of markets, you have to have influence, you have to have networks. And, and your own personal value oftentimes is in your network. That's a go foregone conclusion. It's been around since the history, beginning of time. And therefore, social networks is the most recent, latest area to do that. So more and more working with organizations, we're beginning to see a, a, a much stronger correlation. It's not exact, because there's certainly a lot of very wealthy people out there have no idea. What and once you have the match, they will they will tell you that themselves. Yeah. You know, they will it, it, they will tell you that. So overlaying the two of them together um, and, and and having it done in such an effective way, whether it's overlaying the external wealth data, clearly the social data, which in, indicates your, your connectivity, and using NWS uh, example of your, your membership and your donor data, having all three of those in one central location is certainly, you know, provides you a lot of very, very valuable information. It's what you do with it. <laughs> yeah. And so just one last comment, then I'll, um, I'll get to your question, but a lot of organizations, right, the typical wealth screen will sort of scrape the top, right, where it's sort of fully public CEOs or VPs. The other thing is that who in that 500,000 is not a public CEO, right? Who's the CEO of a local business or other people that can really sort of get into that middle tier, right? So 1,000 to 10,000, right? So that's one of the other things that organizations like Nature Conservancy is doing as well. Um, there's that top tier people where they, you already know probably most of what you need to know about them, but there's a lot of folks um, in that other category who could have a lot to give, um, but it's just undercapitalized, under understood um, at this point. And, and to Dennis and Carly, yeah, the, um, it's not a causation thing. I mean, it's, it's correlated, right? So just because you're on LinkedIn doesn't necessarily make you give more. It's it's a way to discover those people who have more potential, right? It's not just that it makes you give more. And so it's a really important thing to just understand that who are these people in our file? We can understand and engage in a more professional way. And one of my examples um, is there's a senior vice president from Booz Allen Hamilton, right? So probably makes quite a bit of money. Um, World Wildlife, anybody from World Wildlife in here? Okay, I'll give the name afterwards if, if, if they are watching. But um, he's an SVP, makes lots of money. They only ask him for $50 a year. It's not that you know, it's any different, but they just need to know who he is um, to understand what he would give. Right? So those kinds of things are, are there. So in terms of like the one data piece of the score, right, there's a lot more as we saw to that. But in terms of the score, I'd say it's, it's, it's related, right? The difference between when organizations start with an email address, they're going to start out with a much broader set of information about people than just Twitter, right, which is where cloud comes from. So it's like if it's Twitter and then it spawn to try to find other things. Um, the reason that's important is the depth of the profiles 
that can be understood is far greater because an organization has a more intimate relationship from the beginning. So instead of just Twitter analysis, you'll have Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, right? And so that kind of goes into, it's not, it's not necessarily different, right? You really need to understand who are the people who can work with you for different reasons. So certainly related, um, you know, so it's a good, good concept to sort of look at how organizations are doing it, but nonprofits have the benefit, unlike Coca-Cola and big brands, to actually know their donors. Right, they have their email address. It's not just they know in this city, 10 million people bought Coke. Right, so it's a much more intimate relationship, but related. I'll take a slight perspective on that. I think Small Act and Black Bond partnership with Small Act. Um, one of the reasons why we did so is because Small Act has a proprietary matching system and ranking system that is relevant and built specifically for nonprofits. So it's it's designed specifically to help you guys build into these categories be able to leverage that and understand how to use that within your, with your specific campaigns, which is different than Coca-Cola, clearly. You have different needs. So, but similar in terms of the actual information, but much different in terms of the, if its application. A custom cloud score for your organization. Yes? Is there, um, you know, you have So the question is, um, is there anything about how to add um, in Pinterest? Um, so certainly, yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff, like when, when people are sort of understood and found, like Pinterest is certainly one of the, the big ones that we're seeing more of. Um, and the way the system works, there's no limitations, right? Any system that is able to sort of match up email addresses to the profiles, um, that's a big one. One of the differences in Pinterest and why it's not as um, available for um, profile consumption is because the way they got started was by um, logging in with your Facebook account. So there's no genesis from the email address, so a significant portion of their users just have their Facebook account associated with Pinterest, um, and that, that does not allow organizations to use that as the entry point to, to know who's there. So the question about Green Wish is um, if it was organic or you sort of supplemented that with other advertising yeah, campaigns? Advertising or reaching out to individuals or just kind of put it out there or just put it out there. Um, so what we did was we um, we first decided, okay, Green Wish was a good uh, neutral thing because no matter who you voted for or anything else, uh, that was a good place to go. And then we created some images that just inspired people to like, think about the future. Um, and a few sample green wishes, and we blog about it. We posted it on Google Plus and Facebook and Twitter. Um, we were we were really looking for quality over um, quantity, so that we could then seed the the thing. Um, I mean, it was a ticker, and it was it was actually up while the musicians were playing. Um, but we would we would kind of seed it throughout the night, and then that night people would see it and they would make their own green wish. So. Um, we were, I think we only got probably about a thousand green wishes that we could use, but I mean it, it did work out really well and it was mostly just all organic grassroots kind of like, um, I, I typically don't have an advertising budget so I just uh, really cross my fingers and hope people like the idea, but, um, but in this case it was something that we could see. And then actually we do something every year called a wish for wildlife um, with our members and so we were able to like Kind of pull some of that stuff too, just as a as a way to see it. So, yeah. does that answer? Okay. Um, we sent. I don't actually think we sent an email around it because the tough part with an event like this is it's very local and it's expensive to go to. So, um, what I was really using Green Wish for was a, a way to engage anybody, regardless of whether or not they were in DC and if they were ever going to go to the event. Um, but normally, I think if we had more planning time, we would have sent. Like, this was honestly just like on the fly, but um, what we've been doing more and more now is sending email um, traffic to our blog and to different social campaigns. Questions? Yes.
So you actually can, right? So anything that they post publicly about themselves, like on their Twitter bio. Um, so the question is, um, she was asking, you know, are you able to um, understand people in search and segment based on the content that they write about themselves or they talk about, right? Um, instead of just a high level profile. Um, the profiles are, that Ken uh, was showing were just what's applicable to go back into a database, right? That just shows there's such a small amount of information that can fit, like really go into a CRM system. The dynamic range that you would see on a profile, um, that's exactly, so um, for um, TPT, we're looking for people who describe themselves as parents or talk about parenting issues um, socially. So you can, can actually do that. You could look for people if you're doing an upcoming um, running event or a marathon or something like that, you could look for people who describe themselves as physically active or talk about those subjects. So you can actually build those segments, um, and in the tool you can actually save that. So every time you run, it'll get the most relevant sort of people um, at that given time. Yeah, it, the example uh, Mark was mentioning is um, uh, American Cancer. So they had a determination event, so mid and full marathon, and uh, in terms of, it was a higher end event, right? Not just people um, uh, could sort of go and do it on the weekend, so they really sort of focused their direct mail campaign and they looked for people who were both um, key influencers or engagers because it was a higher end, but they had to raise more money, uh, and people who um, were triathletes, runners, cyclists, people who had that sort of athletic propensity um, who could actually fulfill that requirement to finish a race. So they kind of Which tool? How um, many people do you So 350,000, so essentially the, they're, they're really, you know, there will be other tools at this point. Um, the reason, so social vision really would be the only tool to do that. Um, the reason why is it's, it's a new technology that we built out that uses Elasticsearch, which is a free text indexing engine that allows this sort of highly scalable amount of information to be indexed. You can actually search for specific things. Um, so um, that's what we, we have, but there's no other systems out there right now um, that really do that. And, and the reason it's probably like that is because we really focus on the nonprofit sector. And there's such a granular interest in campaign level um, connection that, that commercial organizations don't really focus there. Um, so, but yeah, I'm more than happy to sort of, you know, give you other options as well. Yeah. So she's asking, you know, what, what things can you learn about people? Um, and so it really is all things public. So there's, there's different levels and there's actually different indices coming out. Um, but what they write about themselves, which is static, right? How you describe yourself in your bios, that's, that's available. Um, what they publicly post about, whether it's to you or not. So if it's just talking about running or parenting issues or childhood education, you'd be able to sort of understand that as well. Um, but Facebook is a little bit more, and that's a good example because you, you'll have more availability if they actually post to your page on Facebook. That's where you'll have access to more um, information and data. But it does take a look at the, the sort of broader scope of anybody talking about certain things. And the reason it helps is it, it pairs down those to who you have a relationship with, um, who would be sort of receptive to, to being a, a deeper relationship. I was, I was only going to add to that and just say that um, if, if you aren't, I, I wasn't sure if I was getting your question exactly right, but um, you know, I think Twitter is one of the ones that constantly people keep public. So if you're going to like isolate and really look for people who and how they're defining themselves, I think Twitter is, is a good one because I will say that whatever is publicly available is what you can look through, but it's a little uncomfortable for me, at least when I'm doing outreach, to, to do it through Facebook. Um, or to do it through anything other really than Twitter or like a blog or, you know, because, um, you know, you want to meet them where they're comfortable and where they're not going to be weirded out, right? Um, it depends. It depends on their level of, of, inter like of interaction with you, but um, I would feel uncomfortable reaching out to a, like a bunch of our blog friends or something if it weren't either on their blog or, you know, um, or through Twitter. So like looking at it and seeing really where people are public about their passion, and Twitter is one of them, also their 
like whatever platform they're using to communicate with um, in a public fashion. That, and, and then the amazing thing for me and then what I think about as we're doing this is how do we get um, get it so that we don't have to do, because I used to do manual uploads to our database all the time, how do we get it so that that is aggregated and not manual manual uploads, it's them updating their address information or their LinkedIn profile, you know, they lost their job, so they're updating it to a place where we can then be more respectful of, of them. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times, you know, we send mail to deceased people or, and I think everybody does it, um, but it'd be great if we could start tapping into social media to really um, update us so that we can be more relevant. And, and businesses are doing this already, so um, it's just about us having that intelligence to do it. So. To, to that point, I think like for direct engagement, like she was mentioning, in a respectful way, right? The data's been around like house values and assets and stuff like that. That's not what you lead a conversation with. Um, you just sort of have a, a certain way of understanding people and you send a certain campaign to this group. So like for ACS, they didn't say how we found you, right? Um, but we think this is an opportunity you might be interested in, right? So, so making it sort of general enough where they don't sort of feel um, isolated, but in reality, it probably is more relevant. So it is that sort of, as Daniel mentioned, a win-win relationship of the right type of campaign. I'd be more interested in doing things for kids with PBS than adults, right? So it's understanding and building more quality, relevant relationships. Yeah, and I think with the influencers, they're typically out there publicly talking about the stuff that you care about on some level. And so by providing them content and making it really easy for them, you can be helping them. And I think that's what our goal should be, is to be like, oh, you're a, a subject matter expert on photography. You know, we have a photo contest. I don't know if your people would like it, but if, if you think they would, here's here's some content about it. And you know, like giving them the um, the leg up and recognizing that you see them as someone you respect from your organization. I, I just think there's a way to do it to not be creepy, but creepy for good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag creepy for good. Please don't. I'll send it uh, bumper sticker. Um, any uh, final any final questions? One more question. <laughs> um, well, thank you all so much. Um, again, you know, if you have any questions, let us know, and um, I can set you up with a presentation. And thanks so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.